One of the issues that we're going to face in this course and throughout your lives as ecological analysts is that you often don't know exactly what the best model is. So far what we've done is take a small data set with one or two predictor variables and simply fit the most complicated model that was possible and then evaluate the predictors. But what if we have a great deal of predictors or many possible predictors or alternatively different complex model structures? What we're going to need to be able to do is to evaluate which of those structures or which of those predictors are in fact necessary. One approach to this might simply be to say, well, we'll just use all of the data all of the time. But the problem with this approach is that we're, there's a phenomenon known as the bias accuracy trade-off. That is, adding more predictor variables to your model is generally going to decrease the bias of the model. That is, how different it is from the particular data that you've got. But that reduction in bias comes at a cost in a loss of accuracy. The precision with which you estimate any of the individual coefficients in your model goes down. And so we're going to come back to this bias accuracy trade-off uh, in a few minutes. Let's first look at a couple of simple examples. To illustrate this bias accuracy trade-off, let's think of a, um, an example that was been around the literature on this question for a long time. And that is the question of how many parameters does it take to draw an elephant? Here's a picture of an elephant. It's defined by 36 points on a, on a grid. And what we're going to look at are a series of uh, Fourier fits to this particular set of data points. That is a, a Fourier series uh, analysis then from which you can vary the number of terms in the, in the model from anything up to uh, zero up to the full 36 points. If you look at, uh, if you use five terms in the model, um, those points, you end up with something that looks rather oblongish. It's hard to identify it as anything like an elephant. Ten parameters, you're getting a sense of the size of the object, but you're really not, really, still not getting anything. But by the time you get to 20 parameters in the model, you're now actually able to recognize that, in fact, it's, it's something like a quadruped. Uh, and probably a mammal. And by the time you get to 30 parameters, then it's pretty clear that it's you're looking at an image of a pachyderm rather than uh, um, any other kind of critter. So this is an indication of bias. Your initial bone, as you increase the number of parameters, you reduce the bias between the model, the fitted model, and what's actually under there. Further consideration of this type of thing leads us to what could be called the principle of parsimony. What's been plotted on this on this graph is a measure of the bias squared, that is the distance between the model and the actual data points, if you like, our sum squared residuals. And on the other hand is the variance in the model, or the variance in the parameters of the of the model. Or parameter estimates. And what you can see is that as you add parameters, you're going to reduce the bias. The distance between the model and the actual data is going to shrink. And eventually it'll shrink to zero at the point at which you have as many parameters as you have data points. However, as you do that, as you add those, those coefficients, those extra, per, extra data points that can describe what's going on, you get a steady increase in the amount of variance associated with what you know about those parameters. In other words, how accurate your estimates of those parameters actually are. And ideally, what we're looking for is to find ourselves exactly in this sweet spot here where we have uh, obtained about as good a bias reduction as we're going to get, but also not yet increased the variance in our parameters too much. And so it's looking for this sort of sweet spot in the middle of this diagram that we want to be able to do. One of the problems with analyzing a real data set and thinking about this issue of bias and accuracy and, and trade-offs is that 
you don't know what the right answer is. And in fact, um, it's we, as we discussed before, none of these models are in, are correct, and we know that. So instead, what I'm going to do to try and illustrate some of these principles is to start with an example where we actually know what the right answer is and, and move forward from there. So what I've done is I've constructed a, a rather simple model and I've simulated some data from it. So basically the, the model is, is a simple function that takes a value for x, spits out a value for y, and then adds a small amount of random noise to that value so that the points bounce up and down around the, the functional line. And the amount of noise is actually, is actually quite small. And then what we'll do is we'll fit a series of models to this data and see how well it performs. In fact, with simulated data, we can go one better. We can actually construct several data sets and repeat the sampling, uh, the model selection process on each of those data sets to see how it varies from, from run to run. This equation here is the equation for the underlying true model. So you can see that it is not linear in x. It's got an exponential function in x. Uh, and although it does look somewhat like a quadratic uh, function, at least in these uh, values close to 0 0.3. Now here is our list of approximating models that we're going to look at. Each of these models is a linear model, that is, it contains uh, some coefficients in this case, or some variables, independent variables, in this case these are polynomial functions of x, power functions of x, and a series of coefficients. And we're just adding these different terms together. So we start with the simplest model, which simply says there's some average value. Then we add one, a first order model, which allows us to have uh, y varying as a function of x, second order model, which varies as x and x squared, and so on. In general, throughout this course, we're going to frequently be taking this kind of an approach of constructing a set of models that we regard as uh, biologically or ecologically plausible, and then trying to figure out how much support each of those models has from the data that we have in hand. In this case, we're looking at a relatively simplistic set of models, simply polynomial models. But the other thing to recognize is that, in fact, none of these models is exactly the correct model. We know what the correct model is. It's that exponential function. These models do not match that function exactly. OK, so here we go, fitting our different models. I'm not going to show you the zero order model. Obviously, it, it doesn't fit very well. In each of these plots, the, solid, the heavy solid line represents the true function, the underlying function with all of the noise. And each of the red lines is going to represent an individual realization of that and the, and the fitted model. So our first order models are all straight lines, and, and so as you can see here, we get 10 different data sets, same underlying core model, just different random noise, and this is the amount of variability that you get from run to run. So each of those lines has been fitted to a different sample set of errors from that model, and they're scattering around. One of the things that you notice is that there's a substantial amount of bias. This first order model is not at all capturing the shape of this particular curve. And if you were to look at the residuals of any one of these models, you would see that there would be a very strong pattern in the residuals of first them all being uh, uh, positive, and then all negative, and then all positive again. And that would be a, a fairly dead giveaway that you've somehow under, you've missed some, func some core component of the model, of the real data, I should say. Here's 10 fits to the, of a second order model to the real data. So these now allow for there to be a certain amount of curvature, quadratic curvature to things. And um, plotted against the truth, they look all pretty good. Here's a third order model, or 10 third order fits to this model. And now you can see that although sometimes they're capturing the, certainly the upswing of this model, sometimes they're throwing in a few extra things down around the bottom here where they're uh, curving both back down and, and uh, adding things to the, to the, the, 
that aren't really present in the underlying deterministic model. And that's simply due to the way the random noise has come out in that, in that single example. Here's a fourth order model, set of fourth order models. And we're seeing even more sort of um, odd additions. And finally, a series of fifth order models where things are clearly wobbling all over the place. What I've got here is a plot of the residual variance of our model. That's these open circles here. And this represents a measure of the bias in the model. How far is each of the models from, uh, from the actual data? And I've averaged across all of the different components. These black points, on the other hand, uh, represent the amount of uh, variance in the uh, parameter estimates summed up and averaged across across all those things. And as we add, go from first order models to fifth order models, you can see that uh, those parameter estimates become less and less accurate as well. So if we look at our different groups of models now, it seems pretty clear that this first order models are underfitted that is, they're not representing important features of, of the data. And that these fifth order models are very much overfitted. That is, there's excess stuff going on in there that really doesn't belong. Whereas the second order models look to be just about right. Just right in that sweet spot where they're capturing a pretty good approximation of what's really going on, but also not uh, adding anything extra. However, these categorizations are only obvious to us because we know what the true truth is. It's that heavy solid line and we've got 10 different realizations of our data. Whenever you have to do this for real, you don't have the truth nor and you only have one of those red lines in each of those cases. And somehow you've got to be able to distinguish which ones are the best ones, where that sweet spot actually is. Given that these are linear models, we have a very clear measure of the quality of the fit of the model in the R squared value, or the coefficient of determination. So we could have a look at how the coefficient of determination changes as we add additional parameters, as we add those go up through the fifth order models. What you can see, though, is that although it's there's a clear increase from the first order model to the second order model, as we continue to add more parameters, the R squared only gets larger. And this is in fact uh, quite consistent across uh, every um, model fitting procedure that you're going to look at. When you look at these basic measures of model fit, uh, whether it's the R squared or for later models what we'll be looking at is the, the likelihood or the log likelihood of the model, as we add more parameters that measure of fit is going to get ever uh, better despite the fact that we're adding all of these extra parameters. So this doesn't really help us distinguish between uh, a model that is overfitted and one that is um, just right. It can help us identify when we've perhaps underfitted a model. Now, this problem has been around for a long time, so there have been many, many efforts at trying to figure out how to identify this sweet spot. Um, and a lot of these ideas revolve around the notion of saying, well, what we really ought to do is penalize models that have many parameters. And so if you add a parameter to a model, it ought to help in some way, shape, or form. And so you end up with things, for example, like the adjusted R squared, which essentially uh, reduces the observed R squared by an amount that's proportional to how many parameters you have uh, relative to the number of data points. It's okay to have a lot of parameters as long as you have a lot of data points. However, in our particular case, the adjusted R squared doesn't really uh, help us all that much. It still picks out that jump from the first to the second order models, but then it pretty much seems to indicate that everything from the second through fifth order models are all pretty much of a muchness. So we really would like to have something uh, a little bit better that can help us identify that very narrow band where we think we've, we really can identify things. 